Welcome to a live coding Go tutorial. In this video, we're going to be building a concurrent URL fetcher. I highly recommend you code along with me, as that will be the best way to learn. I'm going to showcase some best practices for using Go routines, channels, as well as sync.waitgroup, and I'm going to explain line by line all of the code. Let's start by defining package main. Every Go program starts with a package declaration, and main just means this file is the entry point for our application. Next, we have our imports. So we import fmt, math slash random, sync, as well as time. The fmt package allows us to print formatted output to the console. The math slash rand package allows us to generate random numbers. The sync package provides concurrency primitives like weight groups. And the time package allows us to measure and manipulate time in our code. Let's start by defining a result struct. This will store the result of each fetch request. Type result struct. And it has three fields, a URL of type string, which is the URL we attempted to fetch. We have a duration of type time.duration, and this is how long it took to fetch the URL. And we also have an error of type error. This is any error that occurred during the fetch operation. Now we want to build the fetch URL function that simulates fetching a URL. Since we're using the Go Playground, we actually have some limitations in terms of making HTTP requests. You can see here that there's a stipulation that specifies that the only communication a playground program has to the outside world is by writing to standard output and standard error. So instead, we're going to simulate fetching a URL. We're going to create a random delay, like waiting for a website to load, and introduce a random chance for an error to occur. So we have a function called fetch URL. It also takes a receive only results channel, which we can define as such. And we populate this channel with result objects that we have defined here. Inside this function, we start by getting the current time using time.now. This timer is going to help us measure how long this fetch operation takes. Now let's simulate a random network delay between 1 and 4 seconds. So we initialize delay to time.duration, where we generate a random integer using rand.intn and pass it in 3000. This will generate a random integer from 0 to 2999. And we'll add 1000 to this to ensure that the network request is at least one second long. After this, we specify that this is in milliseconds using time.millisecond. Now we use the time.sleep function to pause execution to simulate the network delay. So we take the delay of type time.duration and pass it into sleep. Now let's actually measure how much time has elapsed since the fetch started. We do that by initializing duration to time.since start. This will measure the elapsed time from the current time to the initial start time. Now let's randomly introduce a 30% chance that an error occurs. So we declare a var error of type error. Now we want to simulate the 30% chance. If rand.intn of 10 is less than 3, then we generate an error. And this is 30% because 0, 1, 2 are the only candidates that are less than 3. We set error using fmt.error. So we set error equal to fmt.errorf. This is a formatted string, failed to fetch. And we use the string formatter and pass it in the URL. After this, we want to send the result, a success or failure, back through the results channel. And this result is going to include the URL, the time it took, and any errors that occurred. So we populate the results channel with a result struct, and we pass it the URL as the URL, the duration as the duration, as well as the error that we instantiated here. Notice that the fields of the result struct match the fields here. Now let's actually write the main function, which is the starting point of the Go program. We're going to combine all of the different pieces to create a concurrent URL fetcher. Let's start by defining the main function, func. Notice that we have a lot of rand.inn calls, and we actually want our program to be non-deterministic. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the rand.seed function, which is a pseudo-random number generator. This makes it so that every time I run this program, it's going to generate a new number. But you have to generate the number based on something. And there happens to be a value that is constantly increasing, which will simulate non-deterministic or pseudo-random behavior. The answer is Unix time. So we use the rand.seed function, and we pass it time.now.unixnano. And what Unix Nano does is that it determines the number of nanoseconds that have elapsed since January 1st, 1970 UTC. Without this random seed, we would get deterministic behavior for each of these random calls. Now let's define the list of URLs that we want to fetch concurrently. And when I say fetch, what I'm referring to is our simulated network call. URLs is instantiated to a slice of type string. Now let's populate the sample URLs. We have https golang.org. We also have https google.com. And finally, we have https example.com. Now is where sync.waitgroup comes in. 
sync.wait group is going to help us track how many fetches are still running. And it's fairly simple to use. We start by declaring a variable called wait group. I've abbreviated it to wg because this is just convention in Go, and it's of type sync.waitgroup. This comes from the sync package that we imported up here. Now let's create a results channel to collect the results of each fetch call. And the make command is very commonly used to allocate and initialize channels, slices, or maps. So the results is initialized to make, and we pass in the channel of type result. But currently this is an unbuffered channel, but we actually want this to be a buffered channel. And this is because there is blocking behavior for unbuffered channels. For an unbuffered channel, a channel is normally blocked on its send operation unless there is another Go routine that is receiving on that same channel. By creating a buffer channel, for example, let's put 10 here, it means that the sending Go routine can send up to 10 values before blocking on the receive of another Go routine. Instead of hard coding it, let's make our program a little bit more scalable and set it to the length of the URLs. The next step is that we actually want to launch the Go routines. So what we're going to do is that for each URL in our list, we're going to launch a new Go routine to fetch the URL concurrently, and we're also going to use sync.waitgroup. So we're going to iterate over the URLs for index URL in range URLs. Since we don't care about the index, I'm using the underscore to ignore it. Let's increment the wait group by one, telling it that we're adding one new Go routine. We do this by calling the add method, waitgroup.add1. And later on, what we're going to do is we're going to have a waitgroup.wait call and that's going to be running in a separate Go routine, and it's going to block the execution of that Go routine until sync.waitgroup hits zero. So you can really think of this wait group as a counter. Whenever you launch a new Go routine, you add to it, and once that Go routine finishes, you decrement it using waitgroup.done, which you're going to see very shortly. And in a separate Go routine, you can just call waitgroup.wait. It's going to wait for all those other Go routines to finish executing, and then it'll unblock itself. So to spin up a new Go routine is very simple in Go. We actually use the Go keyword. So we start with the Go keyword and create an anonymous function that takes a URL of type string. So the reason this is an anonymous function is because it's defined in line, it has no function name, and we're going to invoke it immediately. But right now it doesn't know what U is. So how we remedy that is we pass in URL as U as such. Now the anonymous function knows to invoke itself with URL as U in this method signature. We're also going to use the defer keyword, defer waitgroup.done. So you know that waitgroup.done basically decrements the counter for the waitgroup. And what defer will do is that it's only going to execute after this outer anonymous function actually completes. You can think of this defer keyword as guaranteeing that waitgroup.done will execute regardless of what happens to this anonymous Go routine. It ensures that the waitgroup counter is going to be decremented regardless of if there's an error or if it succeeds. And within this anonymous Go routine, we're going to fetch the URL. If we look up here, fetch URL takes two parameters, the URL string as well as the results channel of type result. And that's exactly what we pass it. We pass it U, which is the URL defined here, as well as the results channel that we have defined online. Okay, we're getting very close to finishing the main program, just a little bit more code. First, what we want to do is we want to launch a Go routine that waits for all the URL fetches to finish. Again, we have an anonymous Go routine. So we use the go keyword and we create an anonymous function. Inside the anonymous function, we call waitgroup.wait. And what this waitgroup does is it waits for the waitgroup counter to go back to zero. And that's the equivalent to waiting for all the fetches to complete. We also want to make sure that we actually close this results channel. Not only does closing the results channel signal that no more data is coming, but it also avoids potential deadlock. We simply pass the results channel to the close method. And we have to make sure that we actually invoke this go routine by doing this. And finally, let's print some messages to standard output so that the user actually knows that we're fetching URLs. Let's start by printing fetching URLs concurrently. After our main program runs, this results channel is going to be populated with results. And all of that logic is happening in our fetch URL call, where we populate the results channel. So let's loop through the results channel to get the results as they come in. For result in range of results, let's check if there's an error. If result.error does not equal to nil, this means there was an error. And let's use a formatted print using fmt.printf. We want to log the URL as well as the error. Error fetching the URL, which is going to be type string. And to format the error in default format, we use %v. And we can add a new line. Now we populate it using result.url and result.error. In the else case, we successfully fetched the URL. We use a formatted print again, fetched the URL of type string. And we also want to pass it the duration. 
Again, we can use the general purpose percent %V, which formats things in their default format. You can use it to print structs, maps, slices, etc. And we want a new line at the end, and we're going to pass in the result.url as well as the result.duration. Now let's actually run the code. Okay, so the fix, this should be error. Let's rerun it, fetching URLs concurrently. We have one error because of a 30% chance, and we successfully fetched the other two URLs in these durations. I want to clear up a possible confusion. Whenever you spin up a Go routine, it's actually running concurrently with the main program. So this Go routine is not blocking any of this logic. The Go routine is running in the background, and the main program is continuing execution here. So these results are being printed immediately as they are received from the channel. The results are sent to the channel by these Go routines, and since this Go routine is running in the background, the main Go routine reads from the channel and prints the results as soon as they arrive. This main function is going to continue looping and printing results as long as there are results in the channel. So this line for result in range of results, it's going to block until the results channel is closed, meaning it waits for the signal that no more results will be sent. And that's a wrap on this video. I wanted to explore a little bit of live coding in Golang. If you enjoy this longer form content or this new style of video, please let me know. Please leave a like on this video as well as a comment below. And feel free to subscribe to this channel for more live coding videos. It also really helps the channel grow. And of course, if you would like to support me even more, feel free to use the Buy Me A Coffee link in the description below. Thank you very much for watching, and as always, happy coding. See you all in the next one.